You hear a lot that Tim Payne has the second best average of any Australian keeper ever. Well, he did last week. Then he failed and dropped behind Brad Haddon, so I suppose now you'll hear a lot that he has the third best average of any Australian wicketkeeper ever. The only thing you'll hear more is the fact that Tim Payne seems to think he has more friends than most of the Indian players. But I want to go a bit deeper on the second or third best average of all keepers in Australian history. Because even I have written it before. And there's a reason why this entire statement is at worst a bit disingenuous and at best a bit complicated. Because there is a very important thing that is unsaid when this comes up. For over a hundred years, keepers couldn't bat. You can see right here, it took until the 1970s for keepers to get handy, and until the 2010s until they became almost as good as a normal, everyday human batsman. Before 1970, Australia had never had a keeper with a strong average. You can see the difference by average, but also the 100 column, or lack of, probably tells it more. Australia didn't pick players to keep based on their back. Other teams like England sometimes did. Les Ames was a freak, so let's ignore him. But Jim Parks was clearly a choice based on his batting. Clyde Walcott, probably batting, played a big part there as well. But there were other teams who had keepers who could bat. India, South Africa and Pakistan all have guys over 30 on here. You can see by the lack of yellow above the line, Australia were only close with Ben Barnett, who started keeping just before World War II. And that's kind of it. And in the last 50 years, Australia's kind of had basically four long-term keepers. They played 377 tests combined, and that doesn't leave a lot of space for others to begin with. But Australia was moving in the direction of the rest of cricket. In the 1970s, it's clear that things started to change. And by the 90s, keepers were batting at number seven or higher, and they had to be able to bat. You could find a batsman who could keep easier than a bowler who could bat. As a game, we bred batsman keepers, and the last time we had a keeper that couldn't bat at all was in 1968. Specialist wicket keepers are extinct. So back to Tim Payne. If he wasn't batting at this level, he probably wouldn't be in the team. How do I know that? Well, let's hop back here for a moment. Here is Matthew Wade. According to this average game, he would be Australia's fifth best wicketkeeper. But he got dropped once for sure, and realistically, he got dropped twice as a wicketkeeper. Payne averages 12% more than Wade, which is a decent difference. But is that enough of a gap between one of the all-time best at the position and someone else who got dropped twice? But let's step away from Australia just for a moment. How does Payne compare to the world mark since he made his debut in 2010? He is bang on average. So what I am saying is that there is nothing wrong with Tim Payne, but there's also little remarkable about his batting. For instance, if we compare him to the best wicket keepers of the last five years by his average, he is the 10th best. It's also worth looking at the players around him. Just behind him is Safraz Ahmed, his Pakistani doppelganger, the captain wicket keeper who was dropped. Let's move on in case we accidentally jinx Payne. But in front of Payne on this list is Saha, who is in and out of the team, and Besto, who was dropped despite these numbers. Now, all of those are their own kind of weird, but the point is that Payne's average in other countries would mean that his job was in jeopardy. It only isn't in Australia because Neville and Wade failed, and there hasn't been an obvious replacement pushing him. Now, I've only mentioned batting so far because that is the only way that we really judge wicket keepers at the moment. I would love to go deeper into what the actual keeping is worth, but we don't have any incredibly accurate measures. The best we have are probably Crickviz fielding stats. And while they're not perfect, they at least show that Tim Payne is a positive keeper overall. But this was before the third test when he dropped a few catches. Being that runs are a far more accurate measure than a subjective fielding system, teams are going to go with the batsman keepers rather than the keeper batsman until proven wrong. Put it this way, there is a reason keeping has gone in this direction. It's because we can count runs. And even drops and missed dumpings, they're sometimes subjective. Runs are runs. But before we move on, if Crickfizz's numbers are even slightly correct, you get a good idea right here of the trade-off that some teams make with Mushfika Rahim. Even though he is a wicketkeeper, he also has the seventh best average in world cricket over the last five years. And look at some of the names behind him. Root, Azam, and Warner. He is by far the best batsman of the keepers, and perhaps the worst gloveman of the keepers. Now we should point out that he spends a lot more time up at the stumps than say, someone like Tim Payne. But by playing a batsman who can't really keep that well, it's a huge gamble. He strengthens your batting massively, but chances are the bowlers may not always want to ask him out for dinner. As I've argued before, that without a complete change in how we understand the worth of keeping, or a version of Gilchrist who is even better with the gloves than Gilchrist was with the bat, I can't see how we'd ever change anything. Oh, and he'd probably have to be better than Gilly as well, because as good as he was, you could see the batting was already on the way up when it came to keeping. He just made it sexier. But let's discuss Tim Payne and his batting again. 
in 2012, when you're all buying up posters of Brad Haddon, I was out here on the mean street still ripping for pain. I still believe that had he been picked for Australia ahead of Haddon originally, he wouldn't have been hit by Dirk Nannis in an all-star game. Yes, they really had an all-star game. That finger injury changed everything for him, but weirdly, not straight away. Like, here is the year he had his finger mangled. But here is when it really started to go downhill. The finger actually got worse and he found it much harder to bat with. But it's also worth noting that as good as people like me who watched him bat thought pain was, he never actually made big, huge, crazy Sheffield Shield runs. He made a double century early on, opening the batting and not as a keeper. And he never actually averaged over 35 in a Shield season when he played more than three games. In 2009, then-captain Ricky Ponting, who you may have heard of, said Payne was good enough to play as a specialist batsman in the Australian team. And just to put that in perspective, a year later, Ricky Ponting said that Steve Smith was not good enough to play as a specialist batsman. At that point, Payne was thought to be a 10-year player. Instead, he ended up only briefly being a role player with Needed, and then he was a bridge player for the 17-18 Ashes, who ended up as captain because, well, Australian cricket lit itself on fire. And since he came back into the side, his main skill has been not going out. That's never sexy, although it is really handy. This just shows how rarely he's out. That's almost one of five innings. And so many of his best contributions with the bat have been in partnerships, not through his own score. Like there was a 10 test period where he averaged 19 in this comeback. But he did other things, like appear in all these partnerships where quite often other people made the runs. It's a really handy thing to be involved with, but when you average 19 in your last 10 tests, does, you know, anyone really give a shit? And that's been part of the problem with Bain. His average overall is healthy, but he's made no hundreds. He's had a succession of decent knocks, but they're often overshadowed. And his main skill is not being out. And apparently, and I, I, I see this a lot, people like runs. And it's in this middle land where he's always been. So to briefly recap, he was thought to be really good when he was young, but then he was never good enough to be first choice. Then his finger got mangled, and then it actually got worse over time. Then he was about to retire when he was brought back because everyone else had failed. And then he became captain because of sandpaper. It's been a confusing journey and none of that is made easier by the fact, and it is actually a fact, that he has the third best average of any Aussie keeper ever. But let's just take one last look at that. We know that Australian keepers never made runs before 1970 because glove work was thought to be more important. Cool, we can move on from that. But how did those wicket keepers actually fare compared to the rest of the wicket keepers in the world? you could see that they were mostly ahead of South African and England wicketkeepers early on. But as other teams started looking for a little bit more batting, Australian keepers fell behind. And it wasn't until Marsh, Healy and then Gilchrist did this ridiculous thing that they started having batting again. In general, judging players across eras is really tough, but even more so because of the way that keeping has fundamentally changed. So I got Umal Desai to take a look at each keeper against others of their era. You can see here that while Payne is minus one, Ian Healy, Rod Marsh and Bert Oldfield are at par with their contemporaries. Wayne Phillips is actually two up in his short career and Sammy Carter was actually far better than average back in his days. So it is true that Payne has the third best average ever, but I'm not sure that makes him the third best wicketkeeper batsman. I think Healy, Carter, Oldfield and certainly Rod Marsh have a very, very strong showing here. And here is the truth right now. If you are not in your team's best five ever wicket-keeping batting averages, you're probably going to be dropped, like Neville and Wade. But it is worth saying that even if Payne's average is representative of the modern era, Neville and Wade both had better first-class records and they didn't end up with an average this high. And in test matches, Wade had a higher knockout percentage than Payne and he made hundreds. But with every positive we can say about Payne, if Alex Carey or either of the Joshes were burning down the house in first-class cricket, or if Australia had a viable human specimen who could be the captain at the moment without a PR problem or potential injury concerns, then Payne's position would probably be in a lot more peril. And that's largely because Payne is just average. And Australia usually look for better than that. They don't want to be average, they expect to be the best. And Payne is nowhere near Australia's best batsman keeper, nor the world's. None of this means that what Payne has done isn't remarkable. He had an injury that lingered for years. He had to rebuild his game, came back to test when he was virtually retired, and he stepped into a dumpster fire because his country needed a leader. And he has the third best average of any Australian wicketkeeper ever.